I care about nutrient shortfalls because the nickel and diming effect of nutrient insufficiencies chips away at your health, increasing your risk for everything under the sun, from type 2 diabetes to cancer, cardiovascular disease to Alzheimer's disease, headaches to PMS, asthma to osteoporosis, fatigue to increased susceptibility to infection. So stay tuned to learn not just how nutrient insufficiencies silently erode your health, but also what you can do to prevent them. Hit me, producer bots. Dr. Sarah, what is a nutrient insufficiency and why should we care? I think first it helps to understand what a nutrient is. Nutrients are so much more than just energy. Nutrients are raw materials. They are the building blocks of every cellular structure and the reagents that go into all of the chemical reactions of life. So we're made of nutrients and our biological processes use up nutrients to do even really basic things like our heart beating or breathing. And because we use nutrients up, we need to continuously top up our nutrient stores from the foods we eat. Not just energy, but all of those other different building blocks. Amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, minerals, antioxidant phytonutrients. And every biological system in our bodies has a collection of nutrients that it needs to do its job properly. When we're short on nutrients, those biological processes can't work as they normally do. That might mean a chemical reaction is less efficient, producing less product than is required, or an alternate pathway might be necessary, creating a product that isn't as good, or a byproduct that is undesirable or even toxic. It might mean more wear and tear on our cellular machinery, hampering our cells and tissues ability to regenerate and repair. Falling a little bit short of an essential nutrient once in a while is not a big deal. Our bodies are incredibly resilient. But when nutrient shortfalls are ongoing, strain builds up in the biological systems that need those nutrients. And that strain interacts with other risk factors like genetics, age, health-related behaviors like whether or not we smoke or drink, our lifestyle choices like how much sleep we get or how active we are, and social determinants of health to collectively increase our risk for chronic diseases affecting that biological system. So while lack of nutrient resources is not the only factor affecting our disease risk, it is a really clear point of intervention. Think of it like a car engine. If we only focus on putting in plenty of gas, the energy or calories, but neglect the other things that an engine needs to run smoothly, like oil or brake fluid or coolant, then critical components of the engine can't function properly. At first, you might not notice the effects of low oil levels, but over time, the friction increases, the engine heats up more than it should, and parts start to wear down faster than they're supposed to. If your brake fluid runs low, the braking system becomes sluggish, less responsive, increasing wear. Eventually, if these issues aren't addressed, the engine can seize, the brakes can fail, the entire system breaks down. In the same way, when we are supplying our body with plenty of gas, plenty of calories, but not enough essential nutrients, the other things that the engine of the body needs, our biological systems are forced to work in less than ideal conditions, gradually increasing our risk of chronic disease over time. And we are not talking about malnutrition here. So diseases of deficiency are very well understood. A lack of a single nutrient is behind the disease, like how not enough vitamin C causes scurvy. We know exactly how much intake of that nutrient can reverse the disease. With scurvy, it's only 10 milligrams of vitamin C. When we're talking about nutrient insufficiency, we're talking about a level of nutrient intake that is above that 10 milligrams level, above the amount that would cause a disease of malnutrition. There's some oil in the engine, but just not enough. Insufficiency is that entire range between the threshold that would cause a disease of malnutrition and the daily value, like how much our bodies actually need to function properly. For vitamin C, that range is between the 10 milligrams of vitamin C needed to prevent scurvy and 75 milligrams for adult females or 90 milligrams for adult males as the recommended 
recommended dietary allowance. And we care because every nutrient has multiple associations with chronic diseases and everything that can go wrong with us health-wise has multiple nutrient associations. So unlike diseases of malnutrition, it's not one-to-one, -one, but it is a modifiable risk factor, something we can change in our daily behaviors that can pretty dramatically increase our risk of health problems down the road. Dr. Sarah, can you dive deep into one example of how a nutrient insufficiency increases our risk of chronic disease? Yeah, that would be a really interesting illustration of these types of nutrient chronic condition uh, connections. Why don't we look at the example of how low vitamin D increases risk for type 2 diabetes. When we consume glucose containing carbohydrates, so sugar and starch, that glucose goes into our bloodstream and our blood sugar levels increase. Under normal conditions, our pancreas detects that rise in blood sugar levels and secretes the hormone insulin. Insulin then travels throughout the body in our bloodstream and binds to its receptor in cells all over the body. When insulin binds with the insulin receptor in our cell membranes, that causes a series of biochemical reactions inside the cell that ultimately cause the movement of a glucose transport molecule called GLUT4 from inside the cell to inside the cell membrane. And then that glucose transporter can do its job of transporting glucose from the bloodstream to inside the cell, where it can be then converted into ATP, the energy currency of all cells, and used to fuel a variety of biochemical processes. Insulin also signals liver and muscle tissues to convert glucose into glycogen for short-term energy storage, and signals to adipose tissues, fat tissues, to convert glucose into triglycerides for long-term energy storage. So what goes wrong in type 2 diabetes? There's actually a couple of different points where this system can break down. First, you can have adaptations in cells that affect their sensitivity to insulin, like fewer insulin receptors embedded in the cell membranes, or suppressed biochemical reactions that cause the GLUT4 transporter to get moved into the cell membrane after insulin binds with its receptor. You can also have changes in pancreatic function, where the ability to secrete insulin is lower. You get type 2 diabetes when the pancreas can no longer secrete enough insulin to keep blood sugar levels in the normal range. But also, all three of those things are impacted by vitamin D. So first of all, vitamin D has a direct impact on pancreatic beta cell function. Beta cells are the cells in the pancreas that are responsible for synthesizing, storing as pro-insulin, and then releasing as insulin, insulin into the bloodstream. Vitamin D directly affects the beta cell's ability to make and secrete insulin and also affects beta cell survival. So how many of these cells are even in the pancreas to make and secrete insulin over time? So through these effects, vitamin D deficiency results in less insulin being secreted by the pancreas when we consume carbohydrates. But vitamin D also affects how our cells respond to insulin. Low vitamin D levels directly causes fewer insulin receptors to be available in cell membranes. Fewer receptors for insulin means less insulin binding, means less biochemical reactions inside the cell, means less GLUT4 glucose transporter being moved from inside the cell into the cell membrane to shuttle glucose from outside of the cell uh, to inside of the cell. But that's not all. Low vitamin D also affects how well those GLUT4 transporters work. So vitamin D deficiency decreases the glucose transporter activity. So each glucose transporter has less ability to move glucose from outside of the cell to inside of the cell. So we don't make as much insulin, our cells are less responsive to insulin, and our cells are not as good at bringing glucose into the cell when insulin is doing its thing. And we know, for example, that people with vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency have increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. But even in healthy people, having normal vitamin D levels is positively associated with pancreatic beta cell function, insulin sensitivity, glucose tolerance, and glucose homeostasis. And for example, for people with pre-diabetes, we know that for every four nanogram per milliliter increase in serum vitamin D levels, that decreases the risk of that prediabetes progressing to full type 2 diabetes by 25 
2%. I think it's worth emphasizing that type 2 diabetes has a particularly high number of nutrient associations. So vitamin D is not the only nutrient to focus on here for type 2 diabetes prevention, but rather this is one of the nutrient disease associations where like all of the details have been figured out. So it's a really good example of how upping our nutrient intake, ideally getting sufficient amounts of all 49 essential nutrients, can protect our health over the long term. And that's why the goal of Nutrivore is to get all of the nutrients our bodies need from the foods we eat. Ideally, without engaging in restrictive diet mindset, so it's not an on-again, off-again thing. Instead, it's a easily sustainable, maintainable lifestyle. I like to refer to Nutrivore as a dietary philosophy or a nutritional sciences education that helps you make day-to-day -day choices to up your nutrient intake and address nutrient shortfalls that could be eroding your long-term health. Holy smokes, I can't believe that was just one example of how a nutrient being deficient or as you say, insufficient in a nutrient can impact us so much and impacts the development and the progression of these diseases. But like, as you said, every nutrient has multiple disease associations and every health condition has multiple nutrient associations, which of course, why Nutrivore? It all makes sense. Um, but where can we learn more if we want to do more nerdy deep dives like this? So I highly recommend grabbing a copy of my book, Nutrivore. So in this book, there are 27 examinations of a nutrient health condition or, or symptom connection, including this examination of the link between vitamin D and type 2 diabetes. Between those 27 health conditions, I've probably got everything you're worried about health-wise covered, but just in case, there's also an appendix in the back, Appendix B, that lists every single nutrient connected to 120 different health conditions and symptoms. Also reinforcing the Nutriwear philosophy, why our goal is to get all of the nutrients our bodies need from the foods we eat, because all of these health conditions are complex. And of course, if you're interested in diving into nutrients for type 2 diabetes specifically, I have an ebook called Nutrients for Type 2 Diabetes that's available in my Patreon. My Patreon fam gets so many goodies every single month. Two podcast episodes, a nutrient fun fact sheet. There's over 20 of them now. It's like a little two page, all the most important things about a nutrient and a new ebook in a series every single month. Right now we're doing nutrients for health condition and a new ebook with a new health condition drops every single month. Plus you can also get the previous ebook series, which was an eat the rainbow series. There's also the entire Nutribor score database in perusable formats. Uh, there's welcome Nutribor quick start guides and the suggestion box where you can ask a question for my weekly Q and A videos. So if you find this stuff interesting and you're not a member of my Patreon yet, uh, I mean, uh, come join us. We're, we're an awesome community and we'd love to have you.